Welcome back to the Mojo Podcast. For regular listeners, you'll have spotted a bit of a hiatus between episodes. Let's just call that life, shall we? Lots of commitments arriving at the same time, some juggling of projects, my desire to spend more time with my family, and on occasion, to be honest with you, just not having the energy I know I need to nail the production. But it's made me realize how much I miss creating these episodes. So I'm back, refreshed and revitalized. So thank you, Life, for the little reminder of how much I love sharing this podcast with you. This week's episode is in a somewhat similar vein, a reminder from Life that things move and happen in ways we often can't predict, and we certainly can't predict the future outcome of an event, which might seem bloody awful at the time it happens, but at some point it becomes more obvious just why that thing has happened. We're talking about fuck-ups and epic fails. You know, getting fired and having absolutely nowhere to turn at the age of 28 and having to figure out how to survive and thrive after an experience like that is exactly why when I was leading the turnaround of a $5 billion business 10 years later that I had like a reservoir of you know, resilience and techniques and self-awareness to, to, to turn to. My guest this week is Sarah Rob O'Hagan, a force of nature, a super successful businesswoman who has worked in and around sport for most of her career. She was a fabulous guest for many reasons, but fundamentally because of her honesty about the ups and downs of her career and her mojo. She has literally written the book on how to learn from painful lessons in life. Extreme You came out a couple of years ago. It's both a book and a content platform to help you unleash your potential. Sarah has worked for brands such as Nike, Gatorade, Virgin, and is currently the CEO of XOs, the human performance company. She's a sought after expert on business innovation and inspiring human performance. Sarah speaks very honestly about her experiences, which are both illuminating and inspiring. We cover a lot of ground in a relatively short episode today, from her own lessons from the COVID lockdown to where her resilience comes from. We talk about nature and nurture there. We talk about her observations of elite athletes and their demand for feedback to learn and improve, and the importance of some level of movement and exercise for the business brain to function to its highest potential. Sarah talks about the power of sweat working over networking. Really enjoyed this episode, and I'm very pleased to finally release it. Hope you love it too. Please remember to share, rate, and review so more people can discover the Mojo podcast. Okay, over to my conversation with Sarah Rob O'Hagan. Well, welcome back to the Mojo podcast, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a wonderful guest joining me from the US today. Uh, Sarah Rob O'Hagan joining me from New York State. Sarah, how are you today? I'm great, Richard. How are you today? I'm very well, very well indeed. Uh, just dealing with a few technical issues, weren't we, before we set up? Just sli <laughs> slightly challenging my mojo, actually, if I'm oh, honest. No! <laughs> but, we've, but we've got through it. Anyway, this is not about me. This is about you. And I'm, I'm absolutely yeah. delighted to have you uh, on this show today. Another great introduction from a mutual friend of ours, which I always love. Um, and Sarah, as, as uh, I mentioned before, I always start here to get a uh, an idea about where you are today. How is your mojo out of 10 today? My mojo out of 10 today is like uh, 11. It's so oh, good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've got to hear about that. What's been going on? Yeah, well, I have to tell you that here in the United States, we're all very fully vaxxed now. So um, I was very lucky over the weekend to have my first uh, escape with a bunch of friends and uh, we actually snuck off to Mexico for a friend's 50th birthday. And trust me, our mojo was rocking. <laughs> oh, my word. Wow. So like a return to life, if we can rem even remember what that was like, like 18 months ago, something like that. Right. And it was, I got to tell you, I think all of us felt the same way. It was such a reminder of how much we've missed in terms of friendships and fun and just, you know, being normal. Like, it was really quite eye-opening. Every one of us had the same feeling, I would say. Wow. So this so this um, new, uh, pardon the pun, but injection of freedom, yeah, uh, totally. really, really helping with your mojo. So yeah. you, you, you mentioned in there a couple of things that I don't know if that's your general for your mojo to be high, but this kind of sense of freedom, bit of travel, friends are in there. But when, yeah. I, when I say mojo, what, what does that word mean to you? What's coming up for you? 
I think to me, it means, I mean, it's a little bit, should I say qua, but it's the, it's your kind of like your zest for life, I guess. To me, when your mojo is high is when you're thriving and just feeling, feeling that you can be at your very best. So you at your best, mm-hmm. you, do you know, have you got a real good sense of what that is and what the ingredients are then for you to yeah. be there? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I'm, very extroverted (laughs) so and I'm a real people person like that's why I've always found myself in jobs in my life where I'm working with large groups of people and therefore for me the pandemic was incredibly hard I've thought a lot actually about how you know for for decades really introverts have had to live in an extroverted world I've always felt very empathetic around that and this Mm. was the first year where I feel like the extroverts got a taste of what it feels like (laughs) you know because my my husband's an introvert and he's happy as a clam in his little cave working away whereas I have really felt my mojo has gone to the lowest it's probably been in my entire life and I think it was a real it was interesting to me this weekend being with friends laughing just being extroverted again made me remember, gosh, I do need that in my life, mm. you know, to, to be, to be me. And, and you're in, in that classic extrovert sense, you're really getting your energy from being around. Yeah. Obviously these are very special people in your life, but just in yes. general. hundred yeah. percent. Even with my team at work, like, you know, obviously we've been zooming, 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 but it's not quite the same, you know, when you don't have that real human interaction and those just little unscripted moments that I think, you know, in a in a classic meeting room, you might walk in and shoot the shit a little bit beforehand and laugh a bit. Whereas somehow on Zoom, we tend to be much more straight to the point and like, <laughs> you know, getting on with it. Yeah, not a lot of beating around the bush, not a lot of the, the yeah. pleasantries that we uh, we extroverts we might like. Now that we're, we're sort of calling this our conversation about something around learning key lessons in life because I know you've learned a lot and we're going to get into that fully um, in the episode but if we if we do look at the last year that we've lived one that's pushed your mojo down a little bit by the sound of it what have been some of your key lessons just of the just of the last year would you say I mean I, I definitely think I've learned a lot about productivity you know I, I've actually found and I know a lot of my team have shared this too that you know when you remove the commute and you remove like a bunch of things that we all had in our day to day you get a lot of hours back and I think you know for many of us having actually quiet thoughtful time at your desk that I I never used to be able to block that in because I Mm. if I was in the office it, it would always be like someone needs to see you about something right so all of that thoughtful time would generally be in the weekend whereas I so I do think that's been a good thing this year is learning that you know there's different times in your week when you should be sort of doing thoughtful deep you know flow state work which is different to you know the the meetings that sort of cat- catalyze what's what's going to get done so I think that's been a great learning for all of us mm. and that's something that you know I guess we don't really know exactly what the new normal is going to be what sort of level no. of hybrid that's going to be but are you, are you yeah. going to try and capture some of that as you sort of yeah move back definitely to that? We're all doing a lot of thinking about it right now in terms of how do you take the best of what we learned? But then on the flip side, you know, to where we started this conversation, I do think there's a lot that's been lost. And I think it's made me realize more than ever how important just true human connection is, you know, for team building. Like we're one of those companies that we have been going through a lot of change. We've been hiring a lot of new people. And it's weird when you haven't met people ever. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, you know um and just like as we would say break bread with them you know and just get to know them more as humans I think it's really made me realize that you know the person that shows up to work every day if you don't know a little bit more about them which you typically would get standing by the, the you know the coffee machine it just that you don't have the same kind of uh ability I guess to just to to work together as teammates because you're just not not interacting at a more human level and is this because because you, you know your your business and and in one of the many reasons we're talking this is this wonderful intersection of business and sport it's exactly yeah. where you sit and you've sat yeah. for a huge amount of your career yeah. um is there a particular challenge for a business like yours because you're spending you know especially with your clients it is about physical activity a lot of it right yeah. is, is that a particular challenge in in the, in the last year 
Yeah, definitely. Like what, I mean, this has been quite well documented, but the vast majority of my business is we, we run gyms and fitness centers for, uh, you know, fortune 500 clients. And, and we do know from the science that physical activity absolutely has a positive effect on mental and emotional health. Right. Mm -hmm. And suddenly all of these, all of our clients, you know, even though our coaches were able to pivot to streaming services, whether it was, you know, a workout or a breath work seminar or a mindfulness seminar or a nutrition seminar, it's, you still aren't necessarily getting that mind body connection in the same way that we typically would. And at the same time, we were hearing from our clients, gosh, we're really dealing with all these feelings of isolation and loneliness and mental health issues that our teams are really having. And so I think it was definitely a, a lesson for both our clients and us of how incredibly important it is to help people not just get stuck in their cave, <laughs> in their lonely little Zoom chamber all day. But, you know, the, the mind-body connection is really important. So, that, as you said, you pivoted to that challenge and then there'll be a, another kind of, I guess, readjustment coming out of it yeah. to allow people to, I guess, embrace that physicality again, which, yeah. as you say, is so important. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in some cases, that's a, a team building thing too. Like a lot of the programming we do actually brings co-workers together on a gym floor, you know, and it's like, that's just a wonderful way to get to know someone in a different context that you may be teammates with, you know, in, in the boardroom as well. Mm. And your, um, I'd love to get into a bit of your journey to where you are now, as you say, in, in the boardroom and, and leadership, because yeah. you've talked you know, extensively, very publicly about the importance of failure yes. uh, in your career, which is not widely talked about. I guess that level of vulnerability isn't embraced so much, but you went out there, you've written a book on it, um, Extreme <laughs> You. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that journey and some of those, as you, as you said to me when we last spoke, those epic fails yeah. that you've had along the way. So I uh, am actually next week turning 49. So I'm an old lady. I'm a Gen Xer, right? And I would say my career, you know, early on, certainly I had some really big epic fails, including getting fired twice in a row, like, you know, just really big <laughs> things where one would not have thought I was going to go on to, um, to lead large companies at the level that I have. And I realized somewhere, I would say in my late 30s, that while I was recognizing that those major failures, like you know, getting fired and having absolutely nowhere to turn at the age of 28 and having to figure out how to survive and thrive after an experience like that is exactly why when I was leading the turnaround of a $5 billion business 10 years later, that I had like a reservoir of, you know, resilience and techniques mm. and self-awareness to, to, to turn to. And and so I realized that a lot of um, certainly the millennials and now the Gen Zers coming along were being sort of raised with this like perfection mandate. You know, you've got to have this perfect career and you've got to go straight up the ladder. And it's like, well, it doesn't actually work like that for most people. But also the greatest growth really does come from failure. Yet all of the research would say that every generation actually from the boomers on down have become significantly more afraid of failure. So oh, when you're yeah. afraid of failure, you don't take the risk. When you don't take the risk, you can't necessarily move your business to more novel or disruptive thinking and solutions, you know, and it's a cycle that's not really helpful for anyone's career. So in the end, I was like, well, maybe someone like me and other leaders like me, if we just started talking about it more openly, maybe it would help other people realize this is actually how you do lean forward and, and grow. And so that was why I did it. <laughs> mm. Well, so, so it sounds like a very generous thing to do is to reach into your experience yeah. and say, Hey, look, you know, failure is actually very helpful. It's very useful. Don't, don't fear it. And that, and that bit about, I didn't realize about, you know, generationally yeah. we're getting more and more, I guess, perfectionist if that's yes. the flip of embracing yeah embracing uh embracing failure and it's very deep um rooted into childhood actually like all the research you go go back to it starts with uh participation trophies you know when everyone's told you're going to win no matter what which is we all know 
<laughs> that doesn't work. And then you add on social media and Instagram and LinkedIn, you know, every day you open up your LinkedIn and everybody appears to be crushing it. And so you think, well, God, I've got to be, you know, what's the great thing I'm doing? I put like Percy on my LinkedIn profile, I have listed in very bold letters, the fuck ups, the failures, <laughs> because the other thing about doing it, I have learned along the way is um, when you're interviewing for new jobs, if you can walk in the door and own the things that went wrong, you can also control, show the learning and control where you take them forward, right? Whereas when you're sitting there going, oh God, what if they ask me why there's the six month gap on my resume? It's, you know, you're not, you're not empowered to, to lead out off of that situation. So I actually found even this recent job I'm in right now, I remember literally saying, as I was interviewing with the investors and the board, here's what I know I'm great at. And here's what I can tell you, I've really screwed up, learned the stuff where I have learned that if I don't have a good CFO and a good COO around me, I won't do my best work. And it puts you in a much more empowered place, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. In fact, I, it reminds me, I um, a few episodes ago, I spoke to a, a brilliant um, business and sports psychologist, uh, Professor Damien Hughes. And he has a thing where he talks about success leaves clues. But what I'm getting from you is also uh, failure leaves clues as well, right? And then yeah. he talks about embracing yeah, embracing those lessons as well and, uh, and what you can learn from. And so it's, here's the thing. So is there, a, is there anything in here which is, obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing. You know, that kind of yeah. being able to look back and go, well, that was a bit of a disaster, but this, this now is what I learned from it. When you were in it, as you say, in your, in your sort of late twenties and getting and getting fired, what what was it then that kept you going and yeah. maybe kept your your mojo bit a bit enough yeah. up so you could move on to the next thing? It's a great question, um, and I actually have asked this question of a lot of younger generation folks who are risk averse too, because that's the most common question I get. Is like, okay, it's one thing to admit that you failed, but what I really want to know is what did you do afterwards, right? And mm. and I no, for me personally, that it, you know, often with failures, you actually start trying to justify to yourself why it wasn't your own fault. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's a very human thing to do because it's, yeah. you don't want to feel that pain. And usually in any failure, by the way, whether it's um, a marriage breaking down or a, you know, whatever, losing a job or usually there's more to it than your role in it but you have to have had some kind of role in it. And I remember when I first got fired, it was very high profile, embarrassing firing. And it started with actually just admitting to myself, here's what I could have done differently. And I think the minute I did that, it was very freeing actually, because then it was like, okay, well, if I know that, I'm not going to make that mistake again, am I? And it also means that I'm one rung up the ladder in terms of a great learning that I won't do again, you know? And so I do think um, for me, that was the beginning of getting my mojo back, followed by a really big believer after any failure, you definitely have to feel the sort of pain of what just happened. That's a really human part of the healing process. But then the sooner you can start taking a step forward, no matter what direction you go in, then you're starting to move towards the next win as opposed to dwelling on the now. And so in my case, I'd gotten fired. I literally had three months to figure out how to get sponsored for a visa. Or I was going to get deported. So I didn't have much time. Right? Wow. And so high, high stakes. I literally, I just remember it was like, okay, start like ringing people, you know, get lunch on the calendar. Like every move you make makes you feel like you're taking steps and getting momentum. And that's really good for your, sort of mental state when you're going through it yeah yeah that's um again sort of what psychologists would say sort of breaking things down into what the next small step you can take versus looking at this how am i going to climb this huge mountain or get this next amazing job just got to make that phone call and say get that lunch yeah i love that that um just that that break it down and and how much how much in this you know you sound like there's a, a lot of resilience in you from from what i'm i'm gathering yeah is there is there anything in resilience, do you think? Is, is there a bit of a nature nurture in mm. that? Do you think, and I know mm. you're Kiwi by birth, mm -hmm. and I'd love to talk about that as well. And, you know, it seems to be a real resilience in, in Kiwi New Zealand yeah. sport for me. Um, yeah. 
yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but so yeah, where do you think that came from for you? Yeah, it's a really good question because I, I, I do think it's funny being a Kiwi. So I come from like, we're a country of 5 million people with teeny. And I always tell people, I feel like we have what I call the underdog advantage because you know, when we show up to the Olympics, like if we win a bronze medal as a ticket tape parade, you know, we're so excited. It's like, and by the way, if our athletes don't win anything, we're like, okay, you know, whereas if you're American and you don't win the medals table, there will be consequences, you know? Mm. So it's almost like we play like we have nothing to lose, but I have, you know, after 25 years here and becoming an American citizen, I have a lot of respect for the confidence that Americans bring to the table, you know, and they walk in the door going, I expect I have a right to be here. Whereas when you come from a small place, you often kind of, it's, you're almost so self-deprecating that you can get lost in the room a little bit. Um, but I think both sides of that have built resilience for me, at least. Like, mm. I do think that initial, you know, I guess it's nature in a way, growing up in such a small environment where we were just inherently swinging for the fences because you come from such a small place but combining that with the life experience of kind of making your way in a place like America and I I I do think that you know I, I and I, I'm like this when I raise my kids it's like a lot of resilience I think gets built from you deciding to take the big swing yourself without a safety net under you and owning the consequences and a lot of kids today, and I, I, you know, come across, I do a lot of mentoring for sort of college and college above. And, you know, often if someone's got the safety net in place, like, oh, my parents backstopped me for the loan or whatever, you don't have the same risk that you're taking on. And therefore, if it fails, you don't build the outcome of resilience in the same way because you're not having to, you know, to, to build yourself back up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so if there's no safety net, then the, the resilience there is truly yours. It's not someone else's yeah. sort of borrowed resilience. It is absolutely yours and yours alone. Um, that I think I think totally. you're right. I think you do build it up. I think it is that muscle that you can yeah. you can you can work with. Um, and I wanted to sh slightly shift gears a bit. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to sort of the business stuff, but you know, in your your career. Um, you spent a lot of time with working with close to, you know, uh, elite athletes. Yeah. Um, and I know the, the, the business you run now, you do lots of the NFL, you know, the, the yeah. biggest sports franchise in the world, um, mm -hmm. or most valuable, certainly. Um, and yeah, just love to get a sense of coming back to, I guess, to our theme yeah. around lessons and maybe, and, and, and failure. Um, yeah. What, what do you see that, from from the athletes that you've worked closely with you know my uh you see a lot of things but my favorite one of my favorite stories is learning from i was very lucky to get to work with serena williams over the years for actually many eras both when i was at nike and at gatorade and even now and um i remember learning so much from her about kind of how to deal with feedback on how you can be better and it's funny, like in the corporate world, I, I know every single one of us, whether you're a manager giving feedback at, for a performance re review or preparing to get one, it's nerve wracking. Like we all go into like sweat, you know, whereas, you know, world-class athlete, Serena Williams will walk off the court having won a grand slam and will be hungrily standing there waiting for her coach to give her feedback on what she could have done better or differently. It's just that mindset of, how can I continue to be better? And, and it's not scary to her at all, you know? And so why, why do we get ourselves into this place in, in the corporate world where we think sort of constructive or negative feedback is a bad thing? Actually, we should reframe it as it's just a road to you getting better and better and better. And that's what a good coach will do for you. And that's straight back to, you know, I asked you what mojo means to you, if that's being at your best, yeah. then that level of feedback from a, a trusted advisor coach whatever is yeah. i guess surely surely part of that so but yeah this again this this nicely bridges this gap uh, sport business how can we do it better then um, mm -hmm. in in the business world how can feedback become that um that valued thing that uh, as you say a, a, a serena any elite athlete absolutely craves 
Yeah. What's well, funny, I, I'm actually dedicating a lot of my career right now to this topic because the company I currently lead, Exos, um, is a human performance company. And we're actually taking a lot of the learnings that we get from training professional athletes and combining them with the insight that we do know um, in corporate America, both in the startup world, right through to the Fortune 500, 80 to 90% of leaders will tell you they played sports in high school to a decent level. And there's a real correlation between having played sports, teamwork, like setting goals, knowing how to win, how to lose, how to have a game plan, all of those things that are very formative experiences for many of us that we're not always using in our work life today, but we can, at least we believe at my company, we can help build the bridge and tr drive the correlation between um, those experiences. So yes, I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's just like how you reframe feedback. It's like what you would have got from your high school coach wouldn't have bothered you. So why does it bother you when it's, you know, when uh, it's in your career? Is, is there something about, you know, it, and, and I, I firmly believe being being kind is an important thing. I think it's different to being nice. I think there's a real difference. I think I think yeah. kindness comes with it. Um, I think feedback is is kind um, and, and is honest. Is, is there something that are we are we a little scared in in the mm. corporate world about giving that level of, as you say, direct constructive feedback for fear of, oh, where, where I guess where it might lead, yeah. um, how it's taken. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's totally right, Richard. And I think, I think that's because, because in the end there are politics, right? <laughs> and there are, you know, does this person have my best interests at heart? But again, I go back to the greatest teams when we think of the sports world, you know, everyone's always jockeying for position. It doesn't matter if it's corporate or sports, like everyone has to earn their place on the team. And as long as you're driving a team dynamic of wanting the team to win, on some level, I, I, I generally think this for myself, but I certainly say this to people that I mentor, if someone's giving you feedback, like, it's not fun for them either. So why would they want to give you negative feedback just for fun? Like, no, generally that there's going to be something you can take from it. And listen, I, I think we've all had those experiences where you get quote unquote constructive feedback from someone that you may not necessarily like or even respect. But in general, it may be because there's a perception of something you, that, that habit you have or something you do there's always a thread that you can pull and learn if you choose to <laughs> so why not choose to I guess this this lovely correlation between participation in sport um mm. success in the business world that you're you're talking about here mm -hmm. how how far do you take that is that something that um are you are you employing athletes because they just like you know their, their potential is so great when they come out of uh, competitive sport and into business. What, what's, what's that like? Yeah. Yes. I mean, not surprisingly, we attract a lot of people who had a passion for this world, but the other piece I would say is that where we're taking it to is um, generally people who grew up with some kind of sports lifestyle are the same people who now have a fitness lifestyle of some description, highly engaged mm. in, fitness, but they're not always using that fitness lifestyle purposefully. So I'll give you a very simple example of how you can help them do that is there's a lot of science that would show like physical movement um, and body and getting the body moving can actually help unlock the brain creatively. So think about yourself if you're writing a blog post or something and you, we've all had writer's block. If you literally get out of your chair and go for a run and come back, you'll be amazed how suddenly the, the thoughts have unlocked and it, it's scientifically proven. So helping people to say, well, how do you organize your day to make the workouts that you love to do more intentional to the work output that you're trying to create? You know, there's millions of examples like that, or, you know, using um, experiences like, you know, cold plunging to help you 
develop physical resilience and then how you apply that mentally to when you're going into a tough conversation at work. And the thing is that most corporate executives have this whole life going on physically and they're not making the intentional connection to what it can do for them in the workplace. So we're trying to definitely help with that. Mm, yeah, I like that. I think personally, I mean, I'm, I'm talking very personally. I, I know, I, as I said, I get a bit of a block. I go for a cycle ride. Um, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. There you go. There are three ideas. And I, I literally have to pull over on my bike and write yep. them down. <laughs> Because that thing may disappear, no. right? I come back. Oh, that was that was fantastic. I could be sitting at my desk for eight hours and not get to that point. But this idea of, as you say, organizing your time, being really intentional around it, knowing, I like that sort of work out for certain outputs is just a is a is a smart thing to do. So how someone listening to this um, in a business and 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 um, they, they might not be working with your business right now, how how what can they do if they're a leader? in that yeah. business to try and create this kind of culture? And that's a yeah. big question, but I'd love to get into a bit of that. Yeah, well, I'm a big believer in sweat working instead of networking. <laughs> sweat work. okay, tell me about sweat working. Yeah, because I do, like, I have had this experience a ton, which is easy for me because I'm working in these industries. But, you know, when you get a group of people out and I don't care what it is, go and play baseball or rounders or you know, go do a boot camp together, or if you're really adventurous, do a Tough Mudder together. I've done Tough Mudder with a few uh, work groups. And th there are things that help sort of build that teamwork through a completely different lens that you then are able to bring back into your day-to-day -day and sort of unlock, I guess, communication and um, and just that, that team vibe that we all, like we can all remember being a team mate you know when we were in our childhood and we were all in the bus together wanting to go to win like you know and if you can sort of get that vibe to come back into the team in the workplace so that they sort of are tapping into those childhood emotions and experiences I do think it works wonders for how they work together as a team so yeah, I'm pretty passionate about figuring out ways to get them to do that. Mm, sweat work, not network. I love it. Um, so, but so slightly counterpoint then, if uh, you know in your team, your business, there are people, and there are a lot of people who, for whom physical activity has just always not been their thing, right? You know what it's like. I think it starts uh, young, certainly at school, just being put off participation in sport, which is a real shame. But that carries through. Yeah. And you can't force, you, you don't want to force people into doing that sort of thing. What what else can can people do to just start to get some of this stimulation going? But maybe, you know, I love the idea of the tough mudder, but it's probably not for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, Richard, what I would say is that um, I completely agree that it's really hard for people who didn't grow up with this formative experience. And I don't and accept that they can't start somewhere because there's just such an inherently giant benefit to mental health, work performance, life performance, that to not invite them in, on the journey is a, is, is a miss. And that journey, I mean, this is something we preach really at my current company. It can start with the decision to, to go for a 15 minute walk twice a week that's the beginning of a journey, you know, and feeling the difference and then go, gosh, I might make that four times a week. And then, <laughs> and because it is just about inviting people in, in a very unintimidating way and celebrating their little wins. Because for someone, we, we serve clients, honestly, from 20 year old engineers up to 65 year old you know, leaders who are struggling to pick up their grandchildren. How can we help them with just the simple things that would make them be able to do that, which would bring so much joy to them, which would improve their mental health, which would lo lower their stress, you know? So I, I just ultimately don't ever, I, I won't be someone who would ever say, you know what? Yeah, you didn't work out or have that experience. So you shouldn't need to, because there's so many benefits from it that everyone can access it some way. Mm. Yeah, no, I like I like that. It's, it's, it sort of individualizes it in a way. It's yeah. like an understanding of we're not all in the same position. We don't start from the same position, but equally, the benefits are just so good. Just oh. just start something. If if there's a real blockage, what's what advice are you giving 
with that? Is is it literally the okay? Let's do the fifteen minute walk. What what really helps people just sort of get going and start setting some goals? Yeah, definitely. We call it movement snacks for sure. So mm. especially with people who are working from home, or if you're in the office, you know, don't ask someone to pick up the coffee for you on the coffee run. Just make the effort to go get some fresh air. The other one um, is we do a lot of like really super quick breath work sessions where you can just you know jump on and literally reset your, you know, when you get super stressed out, you might've had a bad call with a client or something and just five minutes of a good breath work session can actually really get you centered again. And you're like, okay, I can get on with my day. And so sort of looking at your, um, you know, back, slightly back to the sport thing again, as I know you're, you're, you know, a very keen athlete, I think, endurance athlete am I right yes I do yeah. I know I always feel like a, like an imposter when someone says that but I have done a lot of <laughs> half marathons triathlons yes but I'm not I w- I'm definitely not a good athlete I would say that I'm one of these like people who I complete it it doesn't mean I do it fast <laughs> yeah well I've, 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 I think you're being probably quite modest there um but does that again going flipping back to youth and growing up in New Zealand, sporty New Zealand. Yeah. Um, how important was sport for you then, and how has that kind of carried you? I know it's a lot been in your professional life, but just get into yeah. your kind of athlete life. Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, I I'm joking, but I'm not. In that, you know, I, I have worked at the world's greatest sports companies, and when you're an executive in a sports company, people generally assume you must have been an elite athlete. Like, I'm not making this up. When I was at Nike, I remember having to fill out a survey where they were asking kind of what level of sports background we had. And it said, you know, did you play sports in high school? Yes. Have you run a marathon? Yes. Do you hold a world record? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. Because to be real, I literally never made it past the B hockey team at my high school. Like I'm really not good at sport, but I played a lot. And I, I definitely was that kid who I participated in a lot of stuff, you know? And so... For me, it's funny. That's why I'm a big believer and don't let it intimidate you. Yeah. So in my current job today, you know, if I'm working out on the floor in our Phoenix facility and I've got like an 800 foot tall football player next to me, that could be considered super intimidating. But we really believe that everyone's on their own journey. And so just because I can't lift anything like the weights that someone like that could doesn't mean that my journey is not super challenging and important for me. So I would say the role of sport in my life was just recognizing and learning that to play on a team more than anything and to to set goals and and want to achieve them together, which I think is a pretty cool life experience. And just as we're sort of getting slightly towards the end of our our chat, I'd just love to check in. I know we talked about uh, moving, being physical, sport is important to you. I'd love to get a sense of maybe what are the, the three things or the habits that you've got personally yeah. back to, you know, your mojo for it to be at that, well, you know, amazing 11 as it is today, but at least a good high score. What, what are the things that are kind of non-negotiable, if you like, for you? Yeah, well, I definitely, um, I work out, you know, at least six days a week and that, and I start my day that way. And that is a non-negotiable because that's when I have my quiet time, even away from my kids, my family, my workmates, just to send to myself. I think it's really important to have your own me time at some point in your day. And then secondly, I'd say I'm also a really big believer in work hard and play hard. And so, you know, and I really encourage my teammates to do the same you have to build breaks into your life we can't all be staring at zoom calls all day and we can't all be you know at a certain point a teammate runs out of steam if they're just constantly working to the point where they're not getting refueled i guess and so i'm Mm -hmm. definitely another thing that's not negotiable is i will build in those moments of real levity with my friends and family etc to make sure i just have that balance for sure Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as, um, I mean, as, as this whole episode has been, great lessons, uh, I think, in life and how to keep that, that mojo high, uh, despite going through some, uh, as you say, ep- epic fails, but certainly coming yeah. up the other side <laughs> with, a, with a lot of humility, a lot of learning. 
Uh, amazing. Well, look, Sarah, so wonderful to have you today. Thank you for joining the Mojo podcast. So fun, so fun. And thank you for uh, lifting my mojo. It was fun to spend time with you. <laughs> There you go, a slightly shorter episode, but packed full of content and inspiration. I really love Sarah's energy and frankly her rare and refreshing openness to own her failures in order to better bounce back from them. There's certainly a clear theme on this series based around sport on learning lessons, both from the good times and the bad, from the highs and the lows, from success and from failure. So ask yourself the question, What have you learned recently and how are you taking that realisation and applying that learning to help your mojo? You'll be pleased to know that you won't have to wait quite so long for the next instalment of the Mojo podcast. That will come out in around two weeks time from now. It's an amazing conversation with former England Rugby Sevens captain Ollie Phillips and it's all about transition in life, in his case from the world of elite sport into the business boardroom. So see you then, and please take time, as I say, to leave that short review on Apple Podcasts. It's always so appreciated. Until next time, I hope your mojo continues to flow.